Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. One, two, three, four. Life is too far to walk alone. You can't do it on your own. It's like bare hands digging through stone. And if things go down much steeper hills Even money won't pay these bills But time is sure to show The people gonna be okay Storms never come to stay They just show us how bad we need each other How bad we need each other And the trials of today They are signs Along the way to remind us how bad we need each other How bad we need each other And I can get so high I get so high on myself sometimes Feels like I'm drifting a million miles from this planet What a shame it would be to look back on my life And realize that I've taken you and you for granted People gonna be okay Storms never come to stay They just show us how bad we need each other How bad we need each other and the trials of today, they are signs along the way to remind us how bad we need each other, how bad we need each other. And I can't see what's a mile around the bend, and I do not know where this world is headed or where they end. But you gave me this smile, so I flew. Up. No, you don't pick, pick up, up what, what you, you just, just put, put down. People, People gonna be okay. okay. Storms that never come to stay. They just show us how bad we need each other. How bad we need each other. And the trials of today, they are signs along the way to remind us how bad we need each other. How bad we need each other Are people gonna be okay? Storms never come to stay They just show us how bad we need each other How bad we need each other And the trials of today They are signs along the way To remind us how bad we need each other How bad we need each other
does. Auden says, you know, he, he has these, these stanzas in his poem called uh, As I Went Out One Evening, and the one is, stick your hand in the, the, I can't quote his poem accurately for you, I just read it this morning and I should have it in my memory, but he says, stick your hand in the pail of water, and then you pull it out and look at it, and you realize, think about what, what you've, you've left behind. I mean, the, the, he's talking about the, the finality of, of life, and then stand and look in the mirror, and then gaze and look out the window. And he finally, he says, gaze and look out the window until the teardrops start. Love your neighbor, your crooked neighbor, with your crooked heart. And I think that's, that's where, where authentic love begins. When I realize that my finitude, my frailty, my fragility, my stupidity, my cupidity, my wrongness are all a part of the way I perceive my evil neighbor and what I hate and despise in him, often there's a little bit of it in me. Um, and that I must recognize my own brokenness as I deal with your brokenness. Let's see, how did Jesus say while you're looking at the moat in the other person's eye? Look at that beam in your own eye and be aware there's a commonality of mutual reciprocal repentance here. Maybe. Anyway, Debbie H. Auden, amazing poet, yeah. said something that has stuck with me ever since. She was saying that one of the things that she loves the most about Crosspoint and being a part of the Crosspoint community is how we simply focus on the hard work of loving God and loving people. I love every word of that, every word of that matters because she said that it's simple to focus on the love of God and the love of others. We strip a lot away these are the things that are important. But I love how she said, we simply focus on the hard work of loving God and loving people because loving God and loving people isn't something to dismiss because of its simplicity. Um, it's, it's really hard work if we take that seriously. And I want our music, I always want our music to reflect that as well. And so today we've sung two songs already that orient our minds and our hearts towards God. And I'd love for us now to sing a song because inevitably when we worship God, inevitably he'll turn our attention to the people around us and the hard work of loving people who are different than us, people who frustrate us. It always works outward that way. And so let's sing a song about loving others.
is the garment of our courage The power to make the peace we long to know Crosspoint family. This is Jonathan. So good to be with you today. And so I want to just walk you through a few different things that have been going on. One, I want to let you know that we continue to, as a church, be able to distribute a lot of food to a lot of families each and every single week. Hundreds and, not, and even thousands of meals that keep getting distributed out of our campus. And that, again, is in huge thanks because of your generosity and the way that you contribute, um, the food that you've dropped off. But we've been able to buy lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. We've been able to buy frozen protein that we've been able to then distribute to people in a timely manner and all sorts of different really great things that we continue to do from our food distribution. And it's growing and people are becoming more aware and more and more people are really, um, yeah, finding our food distribution center has just a really important mainstay in their week. And so again, thank you so much for all that you continue to do there. Also wanted to let you know that we partnered with two different organizations this week who are doing really amazing things in our city to serve people that are really vulnerable right now during this time. One is called A Place at the Table, where they serve uh, the homeless population in downtown Raleigh. And they have a fantastic vision and mission of what they do. Um, and they're doing great things. And then also the Jubilee Home, which is serving as transitional housing during quarantine for young men that have just been released from prison and who are don't have any place else to go and who also find themselves in extremely vulnerable positions right now. And so I wanted you to get to hear a little bit from the founders and leaders of both of these organizations for a moment. Hey, Cross Point Church. My name is Maggie Kane, and I am the executive director of A Place at the Table. A Place at the Table is a pay what you can nonprofit restaurant in downtown Raleigh. Our mission is to provide community and good food for all, regardless of means. Uh, but pay what you can. What does that mean? So you walk in, you see a regular restaurant. Uh, you wouldn't even know we're a nonprofit until you get up to the front and someone says, Your suggested price is. So pay what you can means that you can pay that price, you can pay more, you can pay less 
or you can pay by volunteering with us. So pre-COVID, we saw about 50 to 60 people a day volunteering for their meal and lots more paying what they can um, because we know just some weeks are harder than others and all you can do is just pay a couple dollars for your meal. Um, now, with, with and since COVID has happened, we are serving about 300 free meals a day and you are helping make that happen. You have helped buy these 300 meals for people in your community who really just need a meal. Uh, we cannot thank you enough and are so grateful to partner with you. Check us out at tableraleigh.org as well as our social media and you can see some of our awesome, awesome pastries and food. Um, I don't cook, that's our chef, we have a chef. So come and see us and, um, and also pay what you can. Know that you can always come and pay what you can for a meal, whether that's $0, $2, $10. You can come and get a good, good meal. Um, anyways, I look forward to seeing you and thank you, thank you again for really supporting this community and, and helping feed people. Um, we love you, bye. Hey Cross Points, I'm Dave and welcome to Jubilee Home. For those who don't know, Jubilee Home is standing in the gap between incarceration and independence for young men here in Durham, offering housing, life skills, pro-social opportunities, and even some employment options as they transition back towards independence. Or at least that's what we normally do. In this moment, we've transitioned to offering emergency housing for the wave of people coming back from our jails and prisons early due to concerns over COVID-19. Hence, the face mask as we try to keep our community safe throughout this pandemic. Housing isn't all we do though. We spend a lot of time in our neighborhood trying to learn how to be good neighbors in this community and uh, even working with the city of Durham in our neighborhood to create this community garden where we can bring in uh, fresh produce in a, in a food desert in a place where there's very little uh, healthy options for food. And this month, because we didn't have enough going on already, we launched Jubilee Creations from here in our basement. Jubilee Creations is gonna be a job incubator where young men can come and help us build custom-made furniture, playscapes, and landscapes, uh, and uh, provide themselves a living wage, and uh, continue their journey towards independence. Uh, Cross Points, I just wanna say thank you so much for being a part of this journey with us. Uh, we've, we're excited for what's going on here, but uh, we couldn't do this alone. There's no way. The only way this works is with partners like you guys. You guys are bringing life to me, our staff, our residents, and our neighbors with every little bit that you do. And we're just so appreciative. Thanks a lot. So Crosspoint, because of your ongoing financial contributions, uh, we were able to partner with both of these organizations this week and ask them, you give us a list of needs that you have and we want to come alongside and we want to help. And so we were able to take thousands of dollars for each organization and spend it on their list of needs. And whether that's providing food and free meals for the homeless population, whether that's providing cleaning supplies and all sorts of other needs and gift cards for those that are just coming out of prison, all different types of things that we were able to do to help and come alongside Jubilee House and a place at the table. And again, that's because of you and it's because of what you're doing and this belief that we can all continue to do way more together and do a lot more good in our city and our world than any of us can do on our own. And so thanks for continuing to be a part of such amazing, really good stories. Um, if you want to continue to contribute or fund what we're doing together as a church, you can go to, as it says down here, crosspoint.org slash contribute. You can find ways to contribute there with stocks or snail mail or PayPal, lots of different ways, or you can text and you can text the number 77977 and text the word Crosspoint NC there. It'll send you a link and you can contribute real easy with a credit card or debit card or however that you'd want to do that. But lastly today, I am very excited, um, super excited to get to share with you an interview that I got to do recently with a leader and an activist and an author named Lisa Sharon Harper. And so I want to read you a little bit of her bio. Uh, Lisa is the founder and the president of FreedomRoad.us, and it's a consulting group dedicated to shrinking the narrative gap in our nation by designing forums and experiences that bring common understanding, common commitment, and common action. Lisa is the author of several books, including Evangelical Does Not Equal Republican or Democrat, uh, another book called Forgive Us, Confessions of a Compromised Faith, and the critically acclaimed The Very Good Gospel. 
How Everything Wrong Can Be Made Right, which was recognized in 2016 as the book of the year by Inglewood Review of Books. Lisa also earned her master's degree, get this, in human rights from Columbia University in New York City. So that's that's a degree to have, right? One in human rights from Columbia University. And she trained and catalyzed all sorts of Christian leaders in both St. Louis and Baltimore during the 2014 Push for Justice in Ferguson and the 2015 Healing Process in Baltimore. And she's educated faith leaders in South Africa to pull the levers on their new democracy toward racial equality and economic inclusion. And so I'm so excited for you to get to hear this interview with Lisa. And so before we get into it, there's a few things I just want to say up front, that the interview that I um, had with her is about an hour and a half long. And so we don't show all hour and a half this morning. We're just taking bits and pieces of that and putting it together here uh, for our Sunday morning service. But we're going to be releasing the full interview right after the service is over. You can find it on our YouTube channel, Crosspoint YouTube channel. And I'd encourage you to watch the whole thing. She gets into all sorts of different topics. And she doesn't hold back, but she talks about um, abortion. She gets into that issue and talking about it. She talks about why there's a higher death rate um, in the African-American community uh, with COVID-19 and some of the systemic problems that has contributed to that. She talks about why she's a capitalist when lots of people maybe assume that she's a socialist through some of the things that she talks about. She talks about why she thinks um, and why she believes that she's a capitalist and the good parts of that. And so, um, yeah, I just, I wanna encourage you that if you get a chance, um, that you would listen to the whole thing. It's an hour and a half, watch it whenever you want to. Um, but some really, really, really good stuff that she gets into, well worth your time. Second thing is, is I wanna let you know that she talks a lot about in the first half of our interview that I share here on the Sunday morning portion of just about the gospel and what the gospel is. And she references two things that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, but I wanted to give you some context in case you weren't. So one, she talks about the four spiritual laws. And she also talks about this bridge illustration. So I want to put both of those on the screen for you here just for a moment. So the four spiritual laws is something that was developed in the 80s, um, I think in the 80s, by a man named Bill Bright. And it has these four statements. And they were kind of a way to try to walk people through um, a, pres a quick presentation of what was considered then, you know, the gospel message. And how do we tell someone about Jesus? And the bridge illustration was this drawing that tried to equip people really easily on a piece of paper or a napkin that you could just draw out for someone that you could help explain how sin separates people from God and how Jesus helped bridge that gap. And so these were two really popular equipping tools um, in the church at large during the 80s and 90s. And so she talks a lot about that and how that helped shape and inform many of our views of the gospel. Um, and so I wanted to give you context. So when she keeps saying the four spiritual laws or the bridge illustration, you knew what she was talking about. Last thing is I want to let you know that Lisa is going to challenge you. She just is. She is going to challenge you and she's going to stretch you. And you might not agree with everything she says, but you need to know that's okay. That's just fine. Take a breath. It's okay. But her voice and her perspective is one that very much needs to be discussed it needs to be heard, it needs to be listened to, and it needs to be elevated so that we can hear it and wrestle with it. Because for a long time, her perspective and perspectives like hers haven't been given an equal hearing and an equal footing. And so we have a responsibility to make sure that we help elevate that so that all of us can hear and all of us can listen and wrestle with. And so I really hope that you'll do that. I hope that you lean in. I hope that you will listen all the way through and you will let her wisdom and her unquestionable expertise um, speak to all of us and challenge all of us and ultimately all draw us closer to Christ. And so enjoy my interview with Lisa Sharon Harper. Well, Lisa, I'm uh, so grateful, again, that you chose to join us and that you would spend some time with us. It's a great honor um, to learn from you and from your wisdom and from your expertise. And so we're excited to get to spend some time with you. I've already shared with um, our listeners and those who are listening in today about your background and who you are and a little bit of your biography. But I wanted to start off by 
Um, recently, there was an interview that we got to listen to collectively as a church that you were in where you shared that you had gone on a pilgrimage. Mm-hmm. And you realized at the end of that, that the gospel you had grown up with, the good news you had grown up with was mute in the face of the suffering that you had seen. And yes. so I was I was hoping that you could expand on that and you could help us more specifically understand how it was mute and some of the conclusions you came to after that experience. Well, so so first of all, Jonathan, thank you so much for inviting mm-hmm. me to be part of your congregation for this for this week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really truly an honor, um, and so thank you, brother. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so this pilgrimage, this pilgrimage was life changing for me, um, and the reason for that is because I had been one who was so deeply committed to the traditional understanding of the gospel. Um, since my days in college in the 1980s, I was on, I was not on staff, but I was geared toward applying for staff all four years of undergrad with Campus Crusade for Christ at the time, and now crew, right? So right. I was, I was going there. I was there. So the four spiritual laws were like my bread and butter. I, I dreamt about them. I knew them backwards and forward the way that, you know, so, so well that we were writing little ditty songs about them, like funny parody songs mm. about them in, in um, our large group meetings. And, and even in InterVarsity in the 1990s, when we were um, really trying to ask the questions of what does evangelism look like for this generation, this next generation that was coming in, we were realizing that the four spiritual laws, at least in our context, wasn't really hitting the mark as much, but we couldn't figure out why. So, you know, we saw lots of different examples of illustrations of the gospel come out in the 1990s, particularly, I think that probably the most popular one was um, through the Willow Creek. Mm. Um, Willow Creek had the bridge, the bridge illustration. Yeah. Remember the bridge? Yeah, I remember the bridge. <laughs> I was right there right. with you in the 90s. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, I mean, I went to the leadership conferences and the arts conferences. They were, you know, I love them. And and I learned that bridge, and we were we were dr- drawing it on napkins in my staff years in InterVarsity. So I didn't go on staff with Crusade, but I did end up years later going on staff with InterVarsity. And, um, and, you know, and that felt like, you know, it kind of, it, I'll tell you, the bridge kind of hits that Gen X spot where it's like emotive and it's all about healing and brokenness and all that. But it still didn't really, it, it left our students and our staff feeling like racial reconciliation, which was also a huge thing that exploded in the 1990s, the need for it, with the O.J. Simpson trial and the L.A. civil unrest and uprising and um, the the um, Amadou Diallo in 1999 and, um, and also James Byrd, who was dragged behind a pickup truck um, in uh, Jasper, Tennis, Jasper, Jasper, Texas, right? So you have... You have these really big events that were pushing um, Americans, regardless of your religion, to realize race is a problem in our society. And the bridge illustration just didn't hit it either. It didn't really speak to it. So we were committed to racial reconciliation and intervarsity in, in, in our area of Los Angeles, right? We were we were pushing that. And we had read and talked with Chris Rice and John Perkins and, you know, other folk about racial reconciliation. And they, and John Perkins always said that racial reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. And he pointed to a verse that kind of talked to it, but I mean, honestly, it didn't hit it for me. It didn't Mm -hmm. really explain. It didn't, it didn't um, clarify. It left more questions. And so we got to the end of that decade and we were really kind of baffled because a lot of our staff and our students were were saying that this value for racial reconciliation feels like an extra caboose on the train of discipleship. Mm -hmm. It's dragging the train. It's making the train of discipleship feel too heavy. Do we really need this? Is this like a Christianity 4.0 as opposed to a Christianity 1.0 or mm. 2.0 or precursor. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like That's so good. Yeah. How does this how does this actually fit? So it was that critical question that led InterVarsity to invest in this pilgrimage to take 25 of its staff and their families 
um, on this pilgrimage that was four weeks long. Um, It was not a week. It was not a couple, not a half day like a lot of people want to do today. They want to take a trip. No, it was not a trip. It was a pilgrimage. Um, And we were in one bus for for four weeks. We went through 10 states. Um, It was incredibly expensive. And university only did it two times for that reason. But it was also life life changing and transformative of my understanding of the gospel because when I got to the end of that journey and and I was um, pushed really just by me trying to integrate this information to be able to communicate it to staff and students since I was the director of racial mm-hmm. reconciliation in Greater LA at the time for university. I was pushed to try to communicate it in the terms of the gospel I understood, and I couldn't. Hmm. I did not know. I mean, I just had no way of even conceiving of how the bridge diagram deals with slavery. Yeah. It doesn't work on a napkin that way. Yeah. No, (laughs) exactly, exactly. Or how, how the four spiritual laws, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life would be received by my third great grandmother, Leah Ballard, who was enslaved, Hmm. like who was likely a breeder because she had 17 children over Hmm. the course of her lifetime. And, um, you know, how could I go up to her and say, great, great, great grandma, Leah Ballard, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, mm. but you are sinful and therefore separated from God. So the, the very concept, the, the conception, the framework of that understanding of the gospel comes from a place that is um, radically individualized and, um, and also fundamentally about the wellness of the self period Um, and the wellness of the self without regard to oppression or systems or structures that the wellness of the self in that framework is only dependent on whether or not you decide to accept Jesus into your heart and pray the prayer at the back of the gold booklet and then that wellness doesn't actually speak to the wellness of yourself in this world. It's actually really only about the wellness of yourself in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So I remembered um, something my mom said to me years ago um, when I was in, in, I think she actually said it when I was in college in Campus Crusade, and she was exasperated. And I didn't realize that she had a background of faith, but she actually did. And it was actually pretty significant. She was, you know, went through catechism and all the classes all the way through um, grade school till she was 12 years old in the Episcopal Church. And she loved Sunday school. She actually ate it up. And she was coming up as a teenager at the same time that James Cone was writing um, God of the Oppressed and um, uh, um the black black Jesus or something like that. So sorry, but God of the oppressed. And so when she when she said to me when I was in college, she said, Lisa, has it ever occurred to you? You ever wonder why it is the case? Um, it's kind of a brilliant question, actually. She said, Why is it the case that white people, when they talk about the gospel, they're really focused on sin, like you know being forgiven for sin. And when black people talk about the gospel, they're talking about being saved from oppression, Mm -hmm. the oppression of white people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) usually. She said, you ever think about that? And I just kind of poo-pooed her. I didn't Mm -hmm. really think. I was like, no, no, you're liberal, you know, or whatever. I just thought, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, you know, I get to the end of that pilgrimage and um, and I all of a sudden have all these questions. So that sent me into a year of depression, <laughs> that, that, that yeah. pilgrimage, um, because, you know, depression is really all about not feeling like you're in control and having things taken from you. Yeah. Well, my whole worldview was taken from me. And my understanding of the gospel was at the center of my worldview. So I was in a state that sociologists uh, call anomie, like not knowing which way is up or down or having a floor to stand on for a good year. 
And But then I started to actually begin to articulate some things. And over the years, what became very clear to me was that this, this concept of shalom that we were introduced to in our orientation is actually at the heart of the gospel. Mm-hmm. It is it is the very thing that Jesus came to establish. Mm-hmm. That what matters to God is not only getting people into the invisible afterlife. That God actually cares mm-hmm. about the wellness of all of the relatedness within the creation that God created. Mm. Yeah. That God created us to be in good, radically good relationship mm. with, with each other and with the earth and with God mm. and with the systems that govern us. But it is our sin, it is our choices not to trust God, not to choose God, and instead to choose domination mm. yeah. in order to fulfill ourselves. Mm. The domination of creation, the domination of men over women, the domination of, um, of, of systems over all. And, and, and then, you know, flash forward the domination within families, the domination between ethnic groups, which become racial groups, which become wars. Mm. Like really, it, it takes 13 chapters to go from Tov Me'od or very good in, Je- in Genesis 1 to war in Genesis 14. Mm. And it's the very first mention of the word and it happens in the context of colonization. It happens in the context of one king trying to exact his will over several smaller kings. So right there, first 14 chapters of the of the whole Bible, you actually have you have um, what you have a story, you have a framework, you have um, truth that is communicated about what the nature of our relationship with God was intended to be and with each other. And um, Jesus, I believe, is necessary because Jesus is God in the flesh, mm-hmm. brown Jesus, <laughs> who was politically black on the, yeah. on the bottom rung of the political hierarchy of Rome, which was an explicitly white supremacist empire that he was of brown people colonized by white supremacy and he was executed by that white supremacist regime. Mm -hmm. And when he stood up in the very first service he ever gave, he stood up and preached Luke 4. And Luke 4 reflects right back to, to Isaiah 61, which reflects right back to Genesis 1. It all, it's all connected. Um, and he said, he told us very clearly what he came for. What was his good news? His good news is he came to free the oppressed. So I, what I've come to understand after, you know, now 17 years of kind of marinating in Genesis, <laughs> literally, uh, what I've come to understand is that sin is not not being perfect. I was taught in youth group that sin is to miss the mark of perfection. That's a Greek conception of sin, not a Hebrew conception of sin. The Hebrews understood very goodness or perfection to be the radical wellness between all things. It exists between things. It was the Greeks that put perfection inside the thing. So the Greeks were, their whole project was to become perfect. To, to build the perfect table, to, to find the perfect podium, you know, to launch the perfect podcast. But it, that's not the, that wasn't the Hebrew understanding. The Hebrew understanding was relational. And so it was all about the relatedness between all the things in creation. So what I've come to understand sin to be then, if perfection in the Hebrew concept is overwhelming goodness of relationships, 
then sin is anything that breaks any of those relationships. And on the flip side, if sin is about breaking relationships that God declared very good in the very beginning, then what did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to reunite all relatedness, all relationships that were broken at the fall. Our relationship with God, our relationship with self, our relationship between men and women and all genders. Hello, somebody. Mm-hmm. Our relationship between all humanity and the rest of creation and our relationship between the systems that govern us and the ways that when we govern um, not in the likeness of God, not with, with the wellness of all relationships um, at the core, and not trying to protect the capacity of all humanity to exercise dominion mm. in the world, but rather dominating the other mm. and forcing them to bow, bow to our will. When we do that, what we're actually doing is we are, we are forcing the image of God to the earth. Mm. We are declaring war against the kingdom of God because that's how the ancients would have understood that. The ancients would have understood the image of the king is a marker of where the king rules and the wellness, the flourishing of that image throughout the kingdom is an indication of the health of that kingdom, the majesty of that kingdom. People talk about give glory to God. The glory of God is in the image of God on earth the flourishing of the image of God on earth. So when we govern in a way that twists or covers over or crushes the image of God on earth, and there's two really quick and easy ways to do that through poverty and oppression. When we do that, we're declaring war against God. And they were doing that in the time of Jesus. In the time of Jesus, he was born literally the same year that a general came through the Northern Galilee territory where he lived and crucified 2,000 people in one day because they attempted to have an insurrection against Caesar. And why would they attempt to have an insurrection against Caesar? Because he was not benevolent. Because when Caesar came in and took over land, Caesar spread salt on the land so that it would not grow anything ever again. Why? Because that created dependence between that land and and Rome. Now Rome had to provide their food. And now they were dependent on Rome. So when Jesus says, I'm kind of going all over now, but roll with me here. Yeah, just keep going. I'm all right. (laughs) When Jesus says, when he teaches us how to pray, the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus says, um, pray like this, our Father in heaven, you know, he's, he's actually teaching them to pray directly against Caesar, who demanded that his people call him Papa. And um, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That means the most lifted up, the highest place. Your name lives, is in the highest place. Well, that's what Caesar said of Caesar self. But Jesus says, no, no, no. No, not Caesar. God. Yahweh. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. give us this day our daily bread. Well, that was what Caesar used to do. He was Caesar used bread. To, yeah. That's right. Used to roll through the streets and throw throw bread from the cart. Um, so it's really it's Jesus was not apolitical. Jesus was very political. Jesus came against the kingdoms of men that were hell bent on crushing the image of God on earth. Yeah. So my how I would articulate and do articulate the gospel now is to say that. The good news for my grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, my great-great-great-grandmother Leah, is that no matter how far you've been bent by oppression of this world, by the kingdoms of men in this world, the liberator has come. And the good news to those who oppress 
is that they don't have to. They don't have to. It is possible for them to come down off the scaffolding of human hierarchy created by the whole political construct of race or gender or sexuality, all the things that create the hierarchies of human belonging outside and inside the church. It's, it's possible to come down off of that and just be human and let God be God. Yeah. That's freeing. That's good news to people who have been told since the establishment of race in this nation that they were divinely called to rule here. And so therefore, everything is up to them. But it's not. Yeah, what do you what do you say to people that go, you know what, I think yes, we can recognize that atrocities happened in the past and all that, but we just need to move on. Can we just move yeah. on? We don't need to dig up all this old pain and we don't need to dig up all these old stories and I don't need to go back and figure all that out. Let's just all move on. Let's move on mm-hmm. together. So what do you find yourself saying to people when they raise that kind of objection to you? Yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, look, if it all happened back then, I'd say, "Okay, but no, because right. it didn't just all happen back then. The right. thing is, it's never been undone. I mean, yes, okay, so we we had we fought the Civil War, and we we you know declared abolition, and we uh, established the 14th, 15th, the 13th, 14th, and 50th amendments. We did that, and praise God, we did that, and that allowed people of African descent nine years of freedom. You hear what I just said? Yeah. Nine. Mm. Not even a whole decade. Mm. Nine years of freedom. And with that freedom, we elected more than 1,000 people of African descent to elected positions in the United States in those nine years. With that freedom, we established um, institutions, universities, colleges, Um, women's leagues, men's leagues, sororities, fraternities, the whole infrastructure of black life. We established whole cities, black incorporated cities. But when it ended and Jim Crow came and the reestablishment of white control and confinement came, it stopped that. It didn't stop it completely. But we lost more than 5,000 people over, the, over like 60 years. Mm-hmm. We, lost, we lost a lot of people because of that, that structure. We lost movement. We, families were broken apart. Institutions crumbled. Whole cities were literally burned down. Throughout the nineteen, nine, throughout the teens, the nineteen teens, mm-hmm. black cities, black communities were terrorized because of race riots that were ignited by white people throughout the nineteen teens. So any gains, most of the gains that were established throughout those nine years were lost mm-hmm. in the turn of the twentieth century. Meanwhile, at the exact same time, you had the establishment of the Homestead Act. Remember that? Free land in Oklahoma. Free land. Free land throughout the Midwest where people could just run and plant their flag and they got that land from the Native Americans who had been given it because they were already removed from the South because of cotton. You hear me? Mm -hmm. So, so... The Homestead Act actually was one of the most brilliant and also uh, most uh, consequential pieces of legislation that ever hit America because it established the middle class. 
you would have no white middle class, no middle class without the Homestead Act. And then secondly, the, the um, GI Bill. The GI Bill, people come home from World War II and they're poor. Well, we need to give back to our men. And the GI Bill was written by a segregationist. It was penned by a segregationist in a way that de facto limited people of African descent from being able to actually um, actually partake from the goods that the GI Bill established. So most most black GIs were not able to get that that free home or that that no cost loan or or that free college education mm-hmm. that that further entrenched and established the white middle class. Meanwhile, in 1930s, in 1930s, when the Labor Act of 1935 was passed, you had um, you had uh, two things that happened in that time: the Labor Act, and then also um, federal home housing, the Federal Housing um, Association (FHA). The Labor Act um, exempted uh, farm workers and domestic workers from labor protections. So why would that matter and why did they do that? They did that to appease the South, to appease Southerners who depended on low-cost black labor or now Latino labor as well and Chinese labor. When black folks streamed north in the Great Migration, they filled those same slave cabins with first the Chinese and then the Latinos, the Mexicans. And they depended on that low-cost labor, so um, farm workers were exempt from labor protections and so were hotel workers and restaurant workers because those are industries that grew out, were born out of the antebellum economy. And then FHA loans, back in that that same era, our government established policy that immediately said, if there is a person of African descent in your community, the value of the land in that community is immediately lowered. No reason given. Just you could have a millionaire black person living in a neighborhood with white people who are also millionaires and all of a sudden their homes are worth less because a black person has moved in. And that was that that stayed. That was that was there until the Civil Rights Act. It was turned. It was overturned with the Civil Rights Act and all of um, Johnson's War on Poverty. That 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 actually overturned that. But it overturned it. But it didn't overturn all the lost revenue, all the lost mm-hmm. value, all the lost wealth that had accumulated for white people over the sixty years that that um, that that law was established. Yeah. existed. So today, that's why you have a wealth gap between people of African descent and people of European descent in America that is 10 times. It's it's really a tenfold wealth gap. So while the median wealth of middle class white families is $116,000, the median wealth of people of African descent is six thousand mm. dollars. That's why. Yeah. So, look, I'm all for turning a new page, sure. but we can't turn that new page until we actually turn that page. Till we actually undo no. the the impacts, the economic impacts of the systems and structures and policies that were established in the previous era. We have not done that. Yeah. Yeah, You make such a great point because it's, it's systems and it's the systems. It's not oftentimes individuals frame of mind or individuals opinions. It's the systems that have been established that people that also don't know history don't realize the reason you're standing on third base isn't because you worked really hard to get a triple. It's, that's right. That's you worked right. really hard, but you you got already to third. You started on third base by the that's helping exactly hand right. that you got. You got helping hand or your descendants got helping hand, which was great. But other people didn't get that. And so it's not a matter of I just worked hard. It's a matter of, yeah. no, there were systems and policies in place that allowed you to. And that's not to knock 
people's effort and work because there are people that work really, really hard. It's just you can't look down with a feeling of superiority that you've worked harder and therefore yeah. others haven't. And that becomes the issue. So yeah. and I think, you know, this question of politics, why this is so important and why this is so important for the church is because this isn't this isn't a Republican or a Democrat thing. This isn't, you know what, to be a part of the church, you have to vote this way or that way. It's a matter of saying, no, but we need to be people that are trying to advance the kingdom of God. And so we have to yes. be involved in politics. And we yes. have to be aware of that. And we have to say, okay, we can't ignore that and just say, I don't want to talk about it because it's, as you have said, you know, it's attacking the very divine image of God that are in people when we have systems and structures that are doing that. And so, yes, yeah, but it's the systems part that we have to learn to embrace. That's what we have to learn to address in the political conversation in the church. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's why this matters. Politics matters because politics is not partisanship. Right. Politics is never meant to be partisanship. It's not about that. We've made it that. Right. In fact, evangelicals have made it that more than anything else, yeah. more than anyone else. But no, George Washington said it clearly. If your politics gets to the place where you are so hyper-partisan, you will not be able to govern. Mm -hmm. So he actually argued against having parties altogether. No. What is politics? Politics is very simply the conversations that we have and the decisions that we make about how the polis, the people, will live together. Right. And if we, who are followers of the king of the kingdom of God, have nothing to say about that, no. then who are we? Yeah. No. And who Absolutely. is this king? I don't want anything to do with him. If the king of the kingdom of God has nothing to say about slavery, I want nothing to do with him. Mm -hmm. If the king of the kingdom of God has nothing to say about children dying in cages on our southern border and people seeking asylum, which is just simply they're seeking a ship to save them. They've sent out an SOS because their lives are in danger. If if we, the people of God, the people of the kingdom of God, have nothing to say about whether or not those people should be welcomed, when the very last sermon that Jesus gave said, what you do to the least of these, including the one who is traveling through your borders, you've done to me. If we have nothing to say about that, then... Who is this king? I want nothing to do with him. Yep. But the thing is, our king, our king was a colonized brown man who was politically black because he was at the bottom of the hierarchy mm -hmm. within his world. And when he said what he came to do, he said explicitly in black and white, I came to free the oppressed. All this other craziness, that's somebody else. And I think we got the craziness because Jesus himself was colonized. Yeah. I mean colonized by the church. Mm. Colonized, mm. lifted out of his context, yep. put on that cross outside of the context of his people. And the minute that Jesus got into the hands of empire, Constantine, Jesus became an instrument of empire an instrument of the very thing that killed him. Every day We go to war again We assume We know so much more than them Before we hear what they have to say Headline breaks And we start to hate again We're calling them names again And we give our peace away And I hope they see it Cause I wanna see it Let's hope we believe it I want to see 
Crosspoint family, thanks so much for inviting us into your home today. I know that as I listen to Miss Harper and read her work, I am continually challenged by how little I actually know of God. I am a Baptist minister's kid. I went to a Christian college. I did youth group. I have another degree in theology. I've traveled. I've mission tripped. And the more that I um, begin to know, the more I realize how much li how little I know about God, and that what I do know has been shaped by my own personal experience and perspective. I am really relieved to know that there's so much more to know about God and that God is so much bigger than my own personal experience. The video you saw today, um, the message from Ms. Harper, was just a small portion of an interview that Jonathan did with her earlier. If you'd like to see this entire video, it's gonna be posted on our YouTube channel right immediately following our service. If you'd also like to talk more with other people about um, her message and things that she said and dig a little bit deeper into some of those topics, we are gonna have two Zoom calls that you're invited to attend. They'll both be identical. One is Tuesday at 12, one is Wednesday at seven, and you'll find those links and links about other ways to connect online this week in an email that's sent out later today. Before we go, um, we would I would love to offer a prayer for us and, um, send us out into our weeks. So if you want to just pray in a way that's comfortable for you, join me. God of Shalom, may we find peace in the midst of endless routine and days that blend together and can barely be numbered. May we be your co-creators of peace during uncertainty. 
God of the oppressed. It is through Christ we are reminded that we are seen and heard and not forgotten. It's through him that we see what your embodied love looks like. It is your tears for our pain that reminds us to not lose hope. Remind us you're near so that we don't lose heart and that we have the courage to offer strength to others. Be with us in our suffering. Deliver us. God of the oppressor, forgive us for our pride, our greed, and our desire to dominate your creation without regard to life, benevolence, or relationship. Teach us how to begin to mend the damage we have done with our human creations. Creations of unequal systems, of blind domination, of measurements of people by our human standards rather than by yours. Give us the strength to step into the difficulties of listening, rethinking, relearning, recreating, and of asking forgiveness. God of the good news, may we celebrate finding you in the silver linings and our forced slowing down and reimagining in the call of a bird, the unexpected message from a friend, the taste of a cup of tea, the whisper of hope in the coming of spring. Help us to find gratitude in the kindness of strangers and friends, and the necessity of learning new things, and the new definition of community, and the laugh of a child who would normally not be home, and the technology that connects us across zip codes and time zones, in those who give of themselves so that we can be fed and cared for in the midst of crisis, and the extra time to reevaluate, to concentrate, to read, to watch, to listen, to learn about ourselves, to be still. Remind us that our attitudes, actions, and inactions affect more than just us and our circle of understanding. Teach us to love all of your creation as you do. We are slow learners. Forgive us. We are an uncertain people who regularly forget the past. We rarely comprehend the present, and we so often live in fear of the future. But you, God of all things, you are not afraid, and you continue to love us and teach us and point us toward your way. This week, may we be followers of you. Amen. Welcome home.